The Watership Down podcast is intended for listeners who are familiar with the plot. There may be spoilers. This episode is scripted by Newell Fisher with script assistance by John Ruths and is narrated, recorded and edited by Newell Fisher. Hello and welcome to the Watership Down podcast episode 79 in which we will be going through section 19 of the 1978 film Journey to Ephrafa. This coming weekend sees the conference in Glasgow celebrating 50 years since the publication of Watership Down. Needless to say, I'm not there, but hope to include any news from the conference in a future episode. I thought it was about time I updated you all on the range of countries in which this podcast is listened to. I last did this about a year ago. The current listenership by country is United States, 47%, United Kingdom, 28%, Canada, 5%, New Zealand, 3%, 2%, in Australia, Finland and Germany, 1% Israel, Netherlands, Japan and Denmark, and less than 1%, possibly meaning a single listener, I think, in Ireland, South Africa, Brazil, Italy, Austria, Spain, Sweden, Norway, Philippines, Belgium, Mexico, India, Singapore, Malaysia, US minor outlying islands, United Arab Emirates, Russia, Belarus, Vietnam, Switzerland, Brunei, Costa Rica, France, Ecuador, Jersey, Poland, South Korea, Colombia, Thailand, Romania, Nicaragua, Eswatini, Cyprus, Gibraltar, Czech Republic, Greece, Indonesia, Guadeloupe, Guernsey, Egypt, Iran, Namibia, Pakistan, Nigeria, Kuwait, Trinidad and Tobago, Turks and Caicos Islands, Saudi Arabia, Ukraine and Turkey. So there we have it. If you're listening in a country I haven't just mentioned, do let me know and I will give you and your location a special mention. On a more sombre note, I feel moved to mention something that has happened to one of my favourite YouTubers, Canadian Steve Wallace of Camping with Steve, the master of stealth camping whose videos have fascinated me for a long time. He touchingly always referred to his long-suffering wife as just beautiful wife in his videos, which was really sweet. Well, last week, shockingly, tragically and unexpectedly, she passed away. His YouTube, in which he revealed this, is one of the bravest I've ever seen. It made me cry. I send you, Steve, my deepest condolences. You are a good man with a kind soul and an elachrara like mischievousness, and what has happened to you is just so wrong. If any of you are passing YouTube any time soon, I urge you to check out his videos, which are a lot of fun. There will be a link in the notes. Relevance to Watership Down? I'm going to stretch a point and say that you get to see a man having to regard other humans in the way rabbits do though without the use of burrows, all the various serious consequences. Hiding from our species is a fascinating business. Anyway, talking of hiding from humans, let's journey to Ephrafa. Section 19. Journey to Ephrafa. This section covers from 56 minutes to 58 minutes 50, and the equivalent chapters from the book are chapters 30, A New Journey, 32, Across the Iron Road, and 33, The Great River. Chapter 31, the story of El and the Black Rabbit of Inlay, is not used in the film, except for one quotation from the Black Rabbit that is used at the climax towards the end, where it is spoken by Frith. In the 1978 film, there are two kinds of sky on Watership Down. The blue of the optimistic scenes, such as Kihar's flying scenes, and the brown of more ominous scenes, such as when Hazel thinks Kihar is not coming back and decides to lead the ill-fated raid on Nuthanger Farm. As the ominous musical theme rises after Holly's warning, we are back to the brown sky. As Kihar wheels overhead, we see Bigwig looking up at him and setting off at the rear of the expedition to Ephrafa as they set off south. This is not comedy Kihar, this is air support Kihar. And now an aerial shot looking down at Kihar as he flies to and fro over the group as they progress. They arrive at lightly wooded downland and stop by a fence. Fiverr spots a homba or fox as they, and they instinctively take cover. 
Hazel orders them all to stay still, but Bigwig sits up. We see the fox stop as it crosses an open field and sniff the air. It turns in their direction. Bigwig moves along the line of the fence, accompanied by an ominous musical flourish, and then, as there is a curiously light harp sound in the music, he breaks cover. The fox sees him and gives chase. We hear Dandelion ask what he is doing. Fiverr thinks he is trying to draw it off. As the rabbits come out of hiding to watch, we see Bigwig disappear into a bush or copse at the other side of the field. Then, with another ominous flourish, we see Dandelion, Blackberry and Fiverr react in shock as they hear the strangled cry of a rabbit being caught and killed. A close-up on Blackberry as he exclaims, Oh, Frith and Inlay! And then Bigwig is back, demanding that they follow him quickly. Dandelion asks if he is injured. He isn't. They all follow him, and we return to the aerial shot as we see the group dodging in and out of field margins. As they pass a farm, we see Kihar wheeling about above them again. Hazel asks Bigwig what he was up to. He says he just lost his head thinking about Ephrafa. A ground-level shot as Bigwig explains himself as they move past the farm. The ominous theme continues that seems loosely based on, on a part of Kihar's more optimistic theme. Hazel asks why he cried out. He says he didn't. He was pretending to limp and had just stopped, ready to run fast, when he bumped into a group of rabbits. As he explains, the group arrive at a railway bridge with an arch under the track. He had tried to warn them about the homba, but they try just tried to stop him. Now a closer aerial shot of the arch under the iron road or railway track. Kiha has landed on the track. And as Bigwig says he knocked one of them down, a drumbeat starts. We last heard this sound as Holly recounted his escape from Ephrafa over the Iron Road. Is there another train coming? Or something else? Kihar moves to the edge of the bridge. In the distance he spots two rabbits approaching. Their movements are stilted but rapid, stopping then rushing forward. Bigwig is explaining that he heard a squeal as he ran off. Hazel asks if it was the other rabbit the Homba got. Isn't that a bit obvious? Bigwig is saying he didn't see what happened. Just then, Kihar flies down. He warns them urgently not to rest under the bridge. A patrol, more specifically an Ephraf and Y patrol, is coming to find them. He urges them to go to the river, then they won't find them. His accent is getting thicker in his panic. Bigwig snaps into full Owsler mode, telling them all to get under the bridge unless they want their ears chewed off. Kihar backs him up by saying that the Ephrafans seem to not like crossing the Iron Road. Bigwig has come to a decision. And this is the first time we learn about the plan in the film. The reason he was feeling stressed is that the idea is for him to get into Ephrafa. This could be his chance. Hazel says it's too, but doesn't finish. Presumably he meant too soon. One look from Bigwig tells him all he needs to know. Bigwig's instincts will be trusted. Hazel tells Bigwig where and when Kiha will meet him to find out what he plans to do once he is in Ephrafa. And now a shot of the approaching pair of Afrafans with their urgent, stilted movements. Kiha begs Hazel to get going. Hazel tells Bigwig they will go to the river and wait for his instructions. Bigwig impatiently says what he wants them to do is to find a way of getting away from the Afrafans without getting followed. He practically orders them to go. Then, as they all head south to the river, Bigwig goes back under the bridge and hides by one side of the track. The patrol is getting closer. And now an incident that must have seemed very odd to anyone who had already read the book. From among the kale of the field, Heisenthle and Blackavar emerge, seemingly by complete coincidence attempting to escape from Ephrafa. But Blackavar has already had his ears ripped for attempting to escape. In the book, having been mutilated, he is already detained and being forced to show himself at morning and evening Silfle under guard as an example to others. But not here. It seems he was allowed back into the general population of Ephrafa after being mutilated, which has resulted in another escape attempt with Heisenthal. Why was this done? I think it is another example of Blackabar being used as a vehicle to demonstrate the viciousness of the Ephrafan Alsler, as he is at the end of the film when he confronts General Woundwart, as Jamie Club discussed in last week's special episode. And it certainly works. As Heisenthal breaks cover, she is pursued by the two fiend-like Ephrafan Alsler, then Blackavar moves forward. Is he hoping to get away under cover of her foolishness? Overall, this isn't much of an escape plan, but it very effectively displays the ruthlessness of the wide patrol. Spotting Blackavar, they both reverse direction. Strangely, Heisenthal stops running away to turn back and watch what they do. 
the music is reaching a crescendo. Catching up with Blackavar, right by the lane under the rail track, they start to rough him up. Bigwig chooses that moment to reveal himself. In one of the best shots of the film, in my opinion, the two Owsler members leave Blackavar and approach Bigwig, teeth bared and looking more like demons than rabbits. As they menace him, the music calms to a threatening hum. Fade to black. Comparison with the book. In the book, the journey to Afrafa is described in some detail. However, here, due to the need to move the story forward, there is a reliance on the kind of storytelling that could only be done via animation at that time, such as the highly effective aerial shots of Kihar above the group. In the book, there is no close encounter with the Y Patrol as Kihar ensures they avoid them, apart from Bigwig's unfortunate encounter with the fox. In fact, Bigwig doesn't leave the group until they arrive at the river and find the punt, and it is Hazel who decides that the time has come for him to go to Afrafa, another example of the film undermining his authority by transferring this decision to Bigwig. Then there is a simple nose touch between him and Hazel before he sets off. The filmmakers opted for a more dramatic approach, which is very effective at conveying the sheer sense of menace surrounding Afrafa, though Heisenthal and Blackavar's inept escape attempt really makes no sense at this point. However, the looks exchanged between Bigwig and Hazel are very effective and a good example of this film's ability to convey complex emotions in anthropomorphic rabbits. And the behaviour of the Ephraf and Y Patrol is this film at its very best. The sense of menace is palpable. Next time... Bigwig enters the Warren of Ephrafa. Mm.